So, team productivity. This is a topic that I think a lot of us don't think about a lot, but I want to sh kind of shed a light on some things that we've discovered um, that I think apply to pretty much every project that you can come across. So let's talk about it. So like Jeff mentioned, my name is Chris. He gave an introduction. No need for that. Um, if you want to work on React, React Native, GraphQL, Node Elixir, or Rails, come talk to me. We're targeting kind of mid-level folks, but completely open to talking to anyone. Um, we are a remote company, but a lot of us are around Boston. So we'd love to talk to you. I uh, also help organize React Native, the React Native group. I do not organize React Native or organize the group. <laughs> um, so yeah, if, if you're interested in that specific subset of React, come, come out. OK, so let's start off with a familiar song and dance that I think all of us have encountered. It's called Make a New Component. So React is full of components. We do this a lot. Let's take a quick look at what that may be. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a brand new component. And we're going to call it Cool Button. I had to make sure I didn't put a space there. So that was something I had to think about. I'm going to, we use a feature-based structure here. So we're, we just have folders of components. Inside of that, we have different files. I'm creating an index.js and just importing this stuff. I have to type that every time. It's just one line, but that's OK. So then I go and I make cool button JS, and this is going to contain the actual implementation of my component. So uh, I'm going to start typing that and then realize that actually this is too much to type. I'm not sure. Do I want to do a functional component? Do I want to have state? Let's do a functional one, so I'll just go grab this one over here. Um, I'm going to put it in, and actually I pasted it incorrectly because I already had this there. But we just want to kind of pare this down, rename it without using cool VS Code tricks. Um, and just sort of pare this down to the base level. Like, what's, what's our minimal functional component look like? So this is really, for the convention of this particular project, this is kind of what we need. You can see there's some emotion, React emotions, styles. Uh, there's some things there, right? But we don't necessarily need that top one, so I forgot that. But OK, let's create our styles folder, our file, and we'll need to go in. And maybe I'll copy this existing styles file. This one looks OK. Uh, actually. We don't need to do that. But you get the point. There's a lot going on here, a lot you have to think about. So once you do all of that, you get to actually write the code. So this is all just, let's get ready to write code. That whole time, you've just been thinking about all of these various things without actually attacking the problem. So we'll hand wave over actually writing the code. We'll assume you know how to do that. Um, but let's say you submit this PR, and then you get to a code review stage. And they're saying, hey, do you mind? can you add a test to this? You forgot to do that. It'd be really good if we could do it that way. Oh, actually, this, this is the old way we used to do this. We're actually doing it this new way that leverages x. So there's a lot of these type of things that go on. Does this sound familiar at all? Have you encountered this? OK. So what's the problem here? So there, there are a few problems, one being that the source of truth is sort of in someone's head, someone on your team that has decided to own, like, this is our way we're doing it. Um, sometimes it's completely non-existent, and you're just making components and doing things and seeing how it goes. Um, but there's also this problem of being dry. So this we throw around this term a lot just in programming. Just don't repeat yourself. You're doing something in code. You're making you know copy pasting everywhere. You want to try to extract that into something nicer. So uh, it doesn't always have to apply to code. I mean, think about if you're pulling a bunch of numbers together and averaging them, you might make a spreadsheet. Or if you're resizing images a whole bunch of times, you might make a script to automate it. So another problem is that the right way sort of changes over time. Your team might evolve. Uh, the open source project you're leveraging might evolve. And so there's different ways that you know, maybe what used to be the right way is no longer the right way. And how do you get everyone to move to that next stage quickly? So there are some things that exist to help try to solve this, one being boilerplates and starter kits. So if anyone has used these, the idea here is get your project off on the right foot. Get it started with all of you know, X set of conventions, X way of doing things, um, and then you're off to the races. And a lot of these do include generators to where if you opt into this structure, you can generate new components in the way that they set up. If you look up starter kits on the React website, you get a couple at the top that are recommended by the React team, and then you get other starter kits that you can start scrolling through. 
So what the... <laughs> What this tells me is that there are lots of different ways to do things. There are definitely some pockets of conventions, and there are certain patterns that people follow, you know, that, that overlap. But generally speaking, there's a lot of different ways to do it. So you have this thing of, you know, hey, to get started, just choose from one of these. And there's probably more than 30. I didn't actually count them. But um, so how do you get around that? Well, First of all, you're kind of tied to these structures and conventions. And as your project begins to evolve and things change, this can get difficult. Someone has to keep these up to date, right? So the idea being if you opt into one of these projects, the maintainers of that project are keeping it up to date with the latest React, um, you know, various things that, that conform to what they've decided as the conventions for that boilerplate. So you sort of have this thought, OK, so we want this boilerplate, except for this one little piece. So you have to figure out how to handle that. And so you have this decision of, do I fork it or not? And what happens when you fork something, if anyone has done that, which I assume you have, you now are the owner of that new code. <laughs> you are the one now responsible for keeping it up to date. You have to merge in patches from upstream. You have to, there's a lot that is involved in that. And so it's not just a mindless, hey, I'm going to fork this, and we're going to do our thing. So I don't want to maintain something like that, uh, so not really going to happen. So if you've noticed, there's kind of been this trend lately towards flexible conventions. And what do I mean by that? So you have Create React App. That's been a sort of over time, the community has distilled sort of nice patterns to get started. And if you opt into Create React App, you get all these things for free that are really nice. There exists a project called React App Rewired that its sole purpose is to make keep you in the Create React App bubble without having to eject from it. So the default thing, if you are in Create React App and your needs change that are different from what they've decided, like let's say that you want to um, leverage SAS or you want to do, I don't know, there's any number of things that you could pick. Something that requires Webpack configuration, you have to eject. So React App Rewired does a pretty good job of allowing you to just kind of update the Webpack config without fully ejecting so that you can still sort of keep some of those guardrails in place. And it's, it's actually really nice having. So along those same lines, I just kind of want to have everyone think about creating conventions for your team. Like, what's the way that your team writes code? What's the way that, and this may not may be decided already. It may not be decided. Um, but just, just kind of think about that. So why, why would we do this? Well, the first thing would be that you save a lot of busy work. Um, you know, clicking around, you saw what I did on that demo. Lots of clicks, lots of different files. Um, you know, this is not a ton of time that you would be saving just on a pure time basis. This does assume that you do it correctly, so you might mess up and have to kind of do more. But, but really more important than the time savings that are in this is this concept called decision fatigue. And the whole idea here is just do not waste precious brain real estate on low value choices. So I like to think of it as, um, you may have heard this before, a cup that you can fill up every day with decisions. Some can, you can have a lot of little ones, a couple big ones, but when you get to the top, you're kind of tapped out, you're done. Um, so it would be nice to not have to worry about this kind of little stuff all the time. There's some famous people that also very much subscribe to this philosophy. And so what these three have in common is they all wear the same thing pretty much every day, all the time. And the reason for that is so that they don't have to decide what to wear in the morning. Just eliminate that. You have a lot of hard things to deal with and think about. So this is a really powerful concept. So there's no more copy-paste if you take this approach. Um, you can still copy-paste examples from Stack Overflow. That's fine. But just in terms of generating files, you don't need to do that. Um, you basically ensure, by default, if you follow this type of approach that everyone is going to be doing things the new way, as long as you update your sort of thing that generates your templates for you to the new way. So someone still has to own that a little bit, but we'll talk about that here in a second. It also helps when you have new team members. So they don't have to worry about, oh, how does your team do Redux? How do you structure your files? And you walk through that and try to peek through apps. And you could still run into the thing of like, oh, actually, don't look at that app. Look at this app. This is, this is the real one. Um, so it, you, it helps with that. And just sort of this automation thing kind of makes us feel happy. It's kind of a nice thing to just get some pieces automated. OK. So. 
So how do we do that? We, I am suggesting that the best way to do this is to use a CLI. You do not have to, but I'll try to show you some benefits to doing it. So here are some examples of things when using a CLI that can help. You know, you get your file and folder structure figured out. You might generate a failing test. Let's say people always forget to write tests. You could have it generate a test, but you could go one step further and say, actually, let's generate a failing test. So then if they just push that code up, their tests fail. So that's kind of nice. Uh, Redux boilerplate is a really good one because there are a lot of things that you have to create, especially depending on how you decide to structure it. But make sure that when you do this, you're able to customize it. So the thing we don't want to necessarily do is get into this, and I'm not trying to talk bad about any of the boilerplate projects. They're very good. But as you can, you saw from that scrolling example, like needs change and you know your philosophies may change and you may not fully align with it. So I'm gonna go over a couple different options of some CLIs that you can use. Um, the importance here is more the process and the idea. I don't really care necessarily which one you use, but these are a few that I'd, I'd recommend. So there's a project called Hygen that pretty much takes uh, the exact same approach that we started taking manually on projects. And so I really started liking this approach. Here's kind of what it looks like. So first off, this is in a brand, in a brand new project. You can do it with Create React App. You can do it with vanilla JavaScript. You can do it. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't have to be React necessarily. But the idea here is that you sort of install Hygen. It's going to copy over some templates into your project tree. And so in their case, they use underscore templates as a folder. <coughs> And basically, the second line here is setting up a new generator. And so in their world, you're saying, OK, we're going to set up a generator called component. And we're going to do some stuff with that at some point later. Um, so I'll, look, I'll show you some of the files here. And then uh, we'll think about the thing. The command at the very bottom is basically how you would invoke it in, in Hygen's world. And so you say component new. And all of this is configurable as to what you're calling and how you're, how you're doing it. But the idea here being that you're passing a name. So here is what the component template looks like. And this is going to be leveraging the same structure I just showed you in my manual example. And so really what, what we're doing here is we have a, this sort of front matter at the top that's defining what the template, some additional things about the template. So one of the things that you'll often do is just say where you want this to live. Uh, they have a convention on this project for capital N for the name. So we're passing a name as a variable. They decided name happens a lot. So they're going to add a convention to automatically capitalize it. So that's one option you could use. Um, there are lots of other ones that we'll go over here in a second. But you can see that we're basically just telling it what the template should look like. There's nothing super complicated about this. And we're just interpolating some values, in this case, name. That's the only variable we care about. Uh, the index file is pretty much the same as it was, just with the same interpolation. And uh, this is my CSS file, my styles file, CSS. <laughs> so here's what it looks like when you generate it. And so we're just going to type, type that exact same command that I had before, uh, hygiene component new. And I'm using blink, because let's say we're making a blink tag. And you can see that it generates all those files. I'm going to hop over to the editor, and you'll see we're just checking that to make sure that things generated properly. And so from those templates I just showed you, this is what spit out when you run that command. So it seems pretty simple, right? I mean, we can all do this manually. We can copy and paste it. But again, it's, it's eliminating that whole step of just saying, just give me a new component. So that's sort of step one. And then you can take this a little bit further, because if you think about components in React, we have functional components. We have stateful components. We probably need to decide that. And so. Again, this configuration is completely up to you, but in our case, this is what we use a lot. So we're going to add a, there's a convention called prompt.js inside of any one of these commands. And so the way that this is structured, if I didn't mention before, is that you have components and then you have new, uh, new being the command. Um, you could make the, you could make, um, instead of component for, you could make it generate, so you could say generate component or something like that. But this is sort of more of the, out of the box approach they have for this library. So I thought I'd show it this way. But yeah, if you define prompt, you have all these options to say, what do you want it to prompt? Do you want it to be a series of checkboxes where you can check off like two or three things? Do you want it to be one question that goes to a tree of asking other questions? Do you want it to just be an A or B choice? 
And so in this case, what I'm doing is just saying, you know, which type of component do you want? And then once you have that in place, this file's a little bit bigger. But what's really neat about this is we can do the same interpolation that we had before, but there's some additional helpers that I'm using here. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff built in that's one of the standard JavaScript inflector libraries, and I forget the exact name of it. I think it's just inflector. But um, you have the ability to make classify something. So if you've ever used Ruby on Rails, that should be pretty familiar. Um, but basically, I can give it an underscore argument. So I could say user underscore name, and it makes it capital U, capital N uh, for username, all as one word. So it would be like a class would be. And so what I'm doing here is saying, you know, put it at that path, make sure that we're going to capitalize it just in case someone does lowercase or underscore or any kind of, you know, there's a lot that you could do with that. This is just one example. And then there's an if statement here. That's the other major piece. And so we're just basically saying, like, if, if they choose functional, then use this template. If they don't, then use the full class version. So it's pretty easily readable. You can figure out what's going on here. There's not a big complex, like, fork a project, do a thing, push it up, tag it, all of that, just to get the new way in. So basically, these just live top level, and you can just edit them. That's, that's the main thing I was looking for. The next thing is that if you see these, I'll go, go over this in a second, but it's basically that underscore templates folder that's at the top. And that's the best thing. It's alongside your code. The second you decide, hey, we're moving towards something. So let's say that we're no longer using Redux. We move to Apollo. You do that, then you can just immediately commit your templates alongside your source code, have, have that in a pull request of like, hey, we're on to Apollo. And then from then on, everyone's going to generate the files without Redux. So it's, it's a really nice way to, once you decide on something as a team, you can leverage it right away. And so I find having this live right alongside the code awesome. Very, very helpful. OK. So this is an example, just quickly, of what the uh, prompt looks like, just to show you that. Did not type very fast. OK. So right there, I just say, OK, I'm cool button underscored. I'm choosing functional. It generated it with the classified version. You can see everything is kind of there. And then. Um, We'll go back and choose the other option, just to show that one. I just named the command prompt because I had both of these living side by side. I wouldn't name it prompt in real life because that's kind of annoying. Um, instead, I would probably create a functional generator or a class generator if someone knows or doesn't want to be prompted. But yeah, you do it that way. We can automatically set things up in the way that we want in the class version, and you're off to the races. So that's the idea behind it. Um, again, not necessarily this tool, but there's a lot of things that I like about this tool that leverage it. You could also make a Yeoman generator if you are into that ecosystem and know how that works. If you've never done this, that's probably a little more complex than what I just showed you, but it's really not that bad. Um, this tool has been around a lot longer. Um, so there's a lot of different options. So one thing that, that we did before I found Hygen um, we're still using on a few other projects is a, just a quick tool called Launchbox that does a very similar concept. It's a little bit smaller in scope. Um, Hygen has some things where you can in, inject things in files and do a lot of a lot of different things. So you can make a command that injects something into package JSON at the right place and installs from npm and that kind of thing. This was just focused on the generation piece. So similar concept though. It was just a folder that contained templates, and then there was a big config object that sort of told it all where to go. So in this case, it wasn't front matter. Um, it was instead just a big JavaScript file of, here's the thing, here's the component, here's the template, here's the target, uh, here's additional things to run after it's done. So similar thing. So. Side note, this background that I think is kind of funny, I don't really know why I had this on here. You probably can't see it. But it says, please don't try to sleep here, be advised. So I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> so really, the main thing that I kind of want everyone to take away from this is that to try to create conventions for your team, it's, it's super helpful, it's super important. Um, and not necessarily between, you know, you might have multiple projects at work that all have their different sort of conventions, and that's fine too. 
So you can ha you don't have to necessarily update the main team template because all of the source code lives alongside uh, the or all of the template code lives alongside the source code. So uh, it's it's good to sort of just as you're working day to day, just think about repetitive things that you're doing, and that may not even necessarily be code. That may be just you know some something that you do all the time that would be nice to extract. So if you find that thing, try to figure out how to leverage existing tooling uh, to solve it. Or you know, if there's not anything, then you can write it yourself. Um, and just kind of think about ways that you can improve your workflow. Think outside of code, like I mentioned, uh, because it really helps you kind of feel like a superhero. <laughs> cool. So um, that's all I had. Thanks so much. <laughs>